Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mafia and Gangsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another entry here within my playlist. As always, I do these just on a random basis whenever I feel like coming back to these particular set of videos. Someone just mentioned in the comment as well that it's great that these videos focus on some of the lesser known mobsters and that's absolutely the whole point. That's definitely why I do these here. A lot of these mobsters are lost in time. A lot of people don't know about their information. Uh, they get crowded over by some of the more well-known ones. So it's a great way to talk about them here and then share the information for you. It's always fascinating too. My videos here on the Mafia side don't get a good set of views at the beginning, but then afterward people find them and then they get hundreds and then thousands of views. So it's always good to be able to see this trend growing within this playlist. But once again, this has to do with a lesser known mobster whose name was Mike. That was his nickname, but his full name was Michael Merlo, who you're looking at a picture of here. So let's go ahead and let's talk about all the fascinating information associated with this lesser known mobster. So who was this Mike Merlo? Well, he was someone that was born January 4th, 1880, there at a city called Zan. Boca Zabut in Sicily. So being born in Sicily, that would have definitely made him 100% a made mafia member later on in life. Like in other words, he could be absolutely have the books open for him since he was 100% from Sicily. Those of you that know the mafia um, lores know about that strict policy when it comes to that bloodline of sorts. But early on at the age of nine, him and his family moved over uh, to New Orleans. They immigrated here to the U.S. And then ever since then, they, they moved over to Chicago which ended up being a huge influence in his life too. In fact, it was interesting to read this information because it looks like his life ended up becoming very much involved with political ambitions. In fact, I just talked about another mobster a couple of months back, Charles Charlie Bonaggio. I'll include the link for that one below too if you haven't had a chance to check it out. But yeah, here was another mobster who was indeed deeply involved with a lot of areas political-wise, which actually truly has a lot of great power associated within the mafia world. It's funny because there's a great passage in the book, The Godfather, where the Godfather himself is musing about things. And the way he said it was, one person with a briefcase can do far more damage than a hundred gangsters with Tommy guns. And that just goes to show if you truly want power within the criminal underworld within the mafia world you definitely have to be involved in politics and you have definitely have to be involved in other forms of racketeering if you call it that that's just kind of stuff that truly has organized power there in the mafia world but yeah being there in chicago that definitely created an influence for him unfortunately though in 1902 his father ended up passing away due to a stroke and then that left him at the time 22 years old with him and only his mother just left for themselves there in Chicago. But somewhere along the way, he became involved in an area known as Dunion Siciliana, which was an organization built to assisting other immigrants from Sicily coming here to America. There seemed to be a very wholehearted attempt by him to make sure that the welfare of other Sicilian residents, that their welfare is met um, in a good manner. Like in other words, it was probably hard for them, him, his parents, and others to move from Sicily over here to the U.S. He didn't want that same experience for others coming there from Sicily. And so now that he had experience himself on how to traverse it and how to overcome that kind of stuff, he was there ready to help out other Sicilians being able to go there. In fact, he helped champion a lot of people there, a lot of Sicilian residents within Chicago's Little Italy. So definitely if you're there in the Little Italy area of Chicago, a lot of people that live there to this day a lot of people from Sicily, uh, those whether they were there originally or maybe they had grandparents and others, you can probably thank this guy, Mike Merlo, for being able to help a lot of those people originally coming over from Sicily. So that was at least one area that he truly was involved in there in Chicago. But then other influences came from this prohibition. That was, of course, the law, the national law that went in essentially kicking out liquor and other forms of booze within uh, the United States, at least on the front end. Obviously, that just created a huge rise in bootlegging afterward, and clearly the mafia took advantage of this. Such was the case there in Chicago, because here was a guy, Mike Merlo, who was in a prime position to be able to take 
take advantage of all of this. And then using his political influences, I'm guessing that by that point, being in the Chicago chapter of that Union Siciliana, and then working with other organizations, and then also, apparently, this organization became a front for some other type of organized crime. He, in turn, had his hands within a lot of things associated with these up-and-coming bootlegging gangs. This was almost like a Wild West territory when it came to bootlegging. Here was this rich prospect, this rich opportunity to be able to take what was now considered an illegal co uh, a com a commodity and then have it turn into a lucrative avenue for them. But with so many gangs trying to take over at the same time, it was creating clearly some kind of conflict. Like people were just fighting over territorial disputes or being able to share. They were not willing to share, in other words, their profits with one another. There were apparently a bunch of gangs that were prominently fighting between each other and from different organizations and races too. Like there was an Irish gang known as the Northside Gang that was fighting. There was a Sicilian gang called the Gina Brothers Gang. And then there was another gang called the Southside Gang that was run by uh, Torrio and another guy named Capone. Uh, I'm sorry, it was actually run by Al Capone himself. All all of these were just brutal when it came to their territories and then trying to claim what they wanted in terms of, yes, you know, this is my territory, these are my earnings, and so on and so forth. So this guy Merla was almost like a peacemaker. He was someone that was able to use his influence, use his political ambitions, use his way, I guess, of being able to not just sweet talk people, but convince them of what is the right thing to do and he was almost able to create like a uh, mediation between them he was able to take these three gangs and then also other criminal organizations and maintain a quote-unquote uneasy peace between them because believe it or not as i mentioned in some of the other past videos too mobsters would much rather make money than fight amongst themselves i mean cl clearly there'll always be blood battles here and there but for the most part that just creates nuisance and headache loss of members not let alone stuff involving law enforcement and other type of items that come from it like prison and then of course outright death so they'd much rather just band together and make money even if there is an uneasy alliance between them to make sure that yes everyone is happy everyone is getting along and that money is going straight into their account so he was able to almost be like a broker between them and keep this peace going and do so at a lucrative time this was again right during the passage of boot uh, of prohibition right doing the rise of bootlegging and everyone was making money hand over fist unfortunately though this alimony whatever it could be called between them was short-lived because he was someone that ended up passing away at the youngest age of 44 apparently he developed some type of cancer and ended up dying on november 8th 1924 so there he was essentially bartering this kind of stuff and then being able to become a prominent member, not just in those organizations, but also as a peacebreaker between several different gangs. But he ended up dying at that young age, and he also received one of the most spectacular, largest funerals there in Chicago mob history. Get this over a hundred thousand dollars in floral arrangements was given to his funeral. That is huge. This is 1924 dollars, too. So you got to imagine that it's at least two or three times that price today, and then also what you're looking at now is a life-size wax statue this was created for him in dedication to him because of what he was able to do remember i was mentioning earlier one guy with a briefcase is able to do far more than a hundred gangsters with a hundred tommy guns that was what the influence that he had he was able to use his uh, abilities to make sure that everyone was making good money and he was sorely missed after he ended up dying and there was also a lot of prominent people that went to his location to his funeral 10,000 mourners were there and then the mayor was there the state attorney was there the police chief was there even a future mayor was there as well and they were all visiting and paying their respects too in fact if you wanted to go you can go now to Mount Carmel Cemetery and there's a huge mausoleum there made to him made to his name he was interned there afterward uh, after he was moved from another location but you can go visit it to this day and see who this prominent um, no, lesser known mobster was within mafia history and it goes to show how powerful his influence was because two days pretty much after his died 
Guess what? There was open warfare one more time. Bootlegging was still rampant, but now there was nobody to keep things in place. And so the Chicago banks, the Chicago gangs and their warfare just broke out. There was uh, shootings at one of the flower shops immediately. Underboss was murdered. There was another gang, the, the Northside gang, that involved counter strikes against some of the other two gangs. And it was all again about trying to continue to, 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 to assert dominance over certain territories. And eventually, that led to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre a couple years later in 1929. So it goes to show again his death um, essentially caused things to careen to another area and open warfare and then that led to one of the most infamous massacres that we all know of in the world of, of mafia history. But that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all the info associated with this guy, Mike Merlo. Again, someone that you would never hear of in the mafia world but there he was using his political ambition to truly make a good amount of influence out there in the mafia world. He was even portrayed in the film The Untouchables by an actor named Vince Viv Viverito, and he, that's how it goes to show again uh, the type of influence that he had because the movie itself, The Untouchables, chronicling Al Capone and, of course, the other people there in the mafia world, he was in turn at least given a cameo of sorts there too. But if anybody has any more info, anything else you might have missed, please post those comments below. Anybody who happened to be there in the Chicago area, maybe by Little Italy, if you see any other areas there honored, uh, made available, in other words, as a dedication to him, then please let me know. In fact, there's a branch there of the Chicago Public Library that was renamed in his uh, in his name, actually in his son's name, because his son ended up becoming a prominent figure as well within the Illinois House of Representatives. So, again, goes to show the influence that these Merlots had. But again, any information you might have, please post those comments below. All right, everybody. Thanks again, as always. Take care.